All right. A, a hush fell over the crowd. It means it's time to begin, I think. Good morning. Let me get my notes pulled up here. It's good to be with you this morning. We are going to begin our class today in a prayer. It's always an appropriate uh, beginning to our worship and study time together. So let's bow our heads and then we'll open up our Bibles. <clears throat> Father, we're very thankful for this opportunity. We're, we're thankful and blessed to be able to gather without any worry or any fear of, of, of something happening to us. We're thankful for the freedom to express our faith. We're, we're thankful that we have like-minded believers who share the walk of faith that we have and uh, that encourage us along the way. We're mindful of maybe the, the people who couldn't make it here today or for various reasons, maybe they're, they're sick or they're hurting or they're grieving or they're traveling, and we, we pray that they'll be healed and that your hand will watch over them if that's their situation. Pray that you'll be with David and all the campers at 8, 9, and 10-year-old week this week. And uh, we just pray that they can grow and learn and that seeds will, will be planted uh, within them that will grow into faith someday. And we're thankful for all the people who, uh, who work and put all that effort in to, to make that a reality. I pray that you'll bless our study today and, and pray that we will um, have our minds and, and hearts focused on you. Forgive us where we fall short. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We are going to be, if you want to have your Bibles open, we're going to do a, a little bit of a character study today. So I don't know what David is, has been doing, but we're going to do our own, own thing, a one-off for a Sunday. So Genesis chapter 12, if you want to open there, we'll, we're going to talk about a particular person. <clears throat> I lied. Genesis chapter 16, that's where you want to be. Genesis chapter 16. <clears throat> I want to read to you a job description. A job description, okay? So here are the hours. 24 hours a day, evenings and weekends, travel costs not reimbursed. Skills needed. Advanced communication, cooking, cleaning, first aid, teaching, tutoring. Okay? Here's the pay. No pay. You actually have to pay to do the job. Here's the benefits. There's no benefits. No dental, no medical, no retirement plan, and you might even need to find insurance to do this job. So what is the, anybody want to take a guess at what that might be? So he's a janitor. A mother. A mother. Okay. So we're going to talk about a particular mother today in Scripture, and we love to talk about some certain women in Scripture. We love to talk about Mary, rightfully so. Um, we love thinking about Esther or Sarah, uh, people like that. Uh, Hannah, we think about Hannah and her, her raising of, of Samuel and dedication of Samuel to, to the temple. But we're going to talk today about a mother that doesn't always get a lot of air time in Scripture. But I think there are, some, there are at least a couple of profound, in my, in my opinion, profound lessons found in her story. And her name is Hagar. So without a, kind of a cold open here, what do you know about Hagar? Just off the cuff, just what do you remember about Hagar or know about Hagar? See, David, David, y'all let him do all the talking when he's up here. Sarah's handmaid. Sarah's handmaid. Okay. What else do we know about Hagar? She had Abraham's first son named Ishmael. Okay. What else do we know about Hagar? Sarah didn't like her. Yeah. There's a pretty interesting story we're about to read in Genesis 16. And if, and if it's been a while since you've read it, that's actually a good thing. I'd love some fresh eyes on it because I want, I want a dialogue about what you're seeing in the text. Here's a few things about Hagar that maybe you didn't know. So as a, we're not going to spend a lot of time in the background, but if you go back to, to Genesis chapter 12, which we're not going to do today, uh, 
Abraham and Sarah, go, they travel through Egypt. And Hagar is an Egyptian maid. So some people suggest maybe they kind of picked her up along the way in their travels through Egypt and sort of adopted her into the family. Uh, here's a few things about Hagar. She is the only woman in the Bible to receive a, a promise like Abraham's. Now, what was the promise God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12? In your own words. That's right. I'm going to take care of you. Uh, I'll watch over you. You're, you're gonna, you're, your lineage is going to grow, right? More, more than you can count. Hagar is the only woman to receive a promise like that in Scripture. She is the first person in the Bible to be visited by an angel or divine messenger. She is the first person in the Bible to be given a birth announcement. So, you know, birth announcements happen a lot in Scripture. You'll bear a son and you'll call his name Emmanuel. And Hannah was given one of those. Well, Hagar is the first. And she is the only person in the Bible who gives God a name. Usually God is giving people names, and he's giving people a commission. Hagar actually gives God a name, which is really interesting. Uh, she gives birth to Ishmael. She's only really talked about in Genesis chapter 16 and in chapter 21, and she has one quick reference in the New Testament. Now, I'll be honest with you. I, have, I don't know if I've ever heard a sermon on Hagar. Um, she's always kind of a side character to the story of Abraham and Sarah. But let's dive in. So let's read. We're, gonna, we're just going to break this down. We'll read a few verses, and we'll talk about it. We'll read a few verses, talk about it, and we'll make some applications along the way. Does that sound good? So I'm, I'm counting on you here, okay? So Genesis chapter 16, and let's read verses 1 through 2. And uh, would anybody like to read that for us this morning? Just the first two verses. Okay, and then the last little line in verse 2 says that, and Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. Does yours have that? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, and Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. Okay, what stands out to you in those two action-packed, there's a lot revealed in those two verses. What stands out to you? If anything. She is taking things into her own hands. Now, Put yourself in Abram and, and Sarah's shoes. Ten years ago, God made this promise that you're going to have a great lineage and all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And then year after year after year go by, and we're ten years into this. Where, where is God? You know, maybe God is counting on us to, to take it into our own hands, and that seems to be what's happening, okay? Uh, and also, Abram is willing to go along with it, which is kind of interesting, which we'll talk about that as we go. All right, what else do we know or observe about these two verses? Notice that, um, notice that they don't even call her by her name. Sarah says, uh, the, Lord, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. You're going to notice this. They never call Hagar by her name in this passage. And who does Abram listen to? He listens to Sarah. Who should he have been listening to? He should have been listening to God, who made this promise to him uh, all those years ago. And that's really an intentional callback to the Garden of Eden, I think, where you know, we're listening to the voice of somebody else. We're listening to the serpent. We're listening to a family member or a husband. Or we're not listening to the voice of God who gave us this promise in the first place, okay? Now, what do we know about a, a woman's inability to bear children in Bible times? What was it thought of as? A, yeah, it was, it was considered a curse. It was considered you, you, you had failed. That was, your, that was your one main job to do was to produce offspring, right, to keep the family name. And, and so uh, there was a, a desperation at work here. Uh, and what's interesting is God uses infertility a lot throughout Scripture to, to, to make points and to, to teach people and to teach us uh, maybe how to wait on him. Um, 
And so it, when we read about their use of Hagar, it may seem a little bit barbaric. Um, some people have suggested that Hagar was essentially a sex slave. And I don't think I would go that far. I don't think this was necessarily rape. Although it is interesting to think, did Hagar really have a choice? Uh, we're not really told. It doesn't seem like she did, right? She didn't really have a choice. But if you read a little bit, there's some suggestions out there that uh, in ancient marriage contracts, they would build into the co- marriage contract uh, this idea of having a backup plan. And so it's, very, it's also very likely that Hagar was well aware of her role as a potential um, vessel for a lack of better words, okay? So I've seen some people kind of take some extremes that Hagar went along with it and she was okay with it. I've seen people say that, you know, she was raped and she was forced against her will. And I think the truth probably is somewhere in the middle from what I understand. Yeah. So that's how I kind of see it is, you know, like um, being able to be a uh, partner or whatever of the head of the family was kind of revered as something that a woman aspired to. I guess. Well, I think, I think you're onto something, and we're going to see why, because it shows up in a little bit between Hagar and Sarah. There's some mocking and taunting that goes on. I think, I think you're right. Um, any other comments uh, about this? Just a few verses so far. Okay, let's read verses 3 through 6, and and then we'll do kind of a similar just discussion about it. So somebody would like to pick up in verse 3 and read through verse 6 for us. Yeah, through six. Mm-hmm. Then Sarah said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maiden to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in your eyes. The Lord said to me, Your need. So Abram said to Sarah, Indeed, your maiden is in your hand. Do with her as you please. And when Sarah felt partial with her, she said to her servant. So uh, can, you, can you believe that some tension arose in the family because of action? to be what happens when, when we take things into our own hands and try to forge our own path that maybe isn't honoring what God has for us this doesn't always tend to work out the best for us so what do we see what do we observe or what stands out to us in these few verses yeah you know Sarah thought she'd be okay with it and then she gets into it and says well wait a second you know this isn't this isn't as grand or, or whatever as I thought it would be Okay. How does Hagar begin treating Sarah? You know, it, it's kind of a, a little bit of a turn, right? Hagar is now despising and, and mocking or looking down on Sarah. And I, and I can imagine, you know, look at me. I'm going to be the one. You know, God is going to use me to bear his offspring, not you. And so there's some tension between Hagar and Sarah. And perhaps Hagar believes her son is the son of promise. And this is what God's plan was all along. Okay? So what does Sarah do? Who does she go to? She goes to Abram. What does she say? This is all your fault. (laughs) Okay? You know, Abram comes off with a little bit, and and this could be my own uh, spin, so I could be looking at this with my own eyes, but Abram comes off a little bit like a, you know, he's he's just trying to make everybody happy. You know, I just did what you told me to do, you know, and he shouldn't have gone along with this. So that's probably kind of really ultimately, even though we blame Sarah for this, who should have really stood up at the beginning and said, you know, this is not what we're going to do. It should have been Abram, right? So it really does fall on him. But she says, may the wrong done me be upon you. I gave my maid. Notice they never call her by her name. I'll always call her Hagar. I gave my maid into your arms. What does this sound like? Go back to the Garden of Eden. What does this sound like? Remember when Adam and Eve were like, 
You know, well, it, you know, she says, well, it was the serpent's fault. And then goes to, goes to Adam, well, it was the wife you gave me, God. You gave her to me, and she tempted me. All right, all this blame. I gave my maid into your arms, and I was despised in her sight. May the Lord uh, judge between you and me. And then Abram gives it back to her and says, hey, you know what? She's in your power. Do what's good in your sight. And Sarah treats her harshly. Uh, and she fled from her presence. So think about Hagar. She, uh, in her opinion, she is better off out in the wilderness, pregnant, alone, than being with Abram and Sarah. Now, what kind of a toxic environment must that have been? Okay. So a couple of interesting notes here. The word harsh, it says Sarah treated her harshly. That's the same word that is described to uh, Pharaoh's treatment an Egyptian, of the Israelites. Just kind of an interesting thing there between Egyptians and Israelites. Sarah treats an Egyptian maid harshly. Um, and, you know, the Israelites fled from Egypt, right, after being treated harshly. It's kind of an interesting little parallel there. Um, so consider Hagar's position. Uh, she's essentially been powerless this entire time. I, I don't think she's had a lot of say-so, although maybe she was written into the marriage vows or contract. Um, the two people who put you in this position, and these are people who claim to honor God and live godly, that God's people, those two people are now casting you out. And that's essentially a death sentence in this day and age. And consider Hagar's choice. She would rather choose death than to be around Sarah. Um, a pregnant woman on the run in the wilderness. And that's how they treated her. You know... Have you ever been treated harshly by someone and thought, do they even know what they're putting me through? You know? Um, or to be around somebody and it's such a negative experience for you, you'd rather be anywhere else than around that person or around that environment. And that's what Hagar decides to do. Any other thoughts or comments about these verses? Verses 3 through 6 before we move on. Or observations. That's right. They're both complicit, right? They, you know, maybe it was Sarah's idea, but it was also a Abraham was or Abram at this time was just as guilty for this whole situation that unfolded, right? And what's interesting is that this is just a microcosm of, of scripture, if you think about it. You know, what do what do people in scripture try to do over and over again? They try to take things for themselves. They try to take matters into their own hands. And where does it always end up? It always ends up not working out. Uh, think about the time of the judges. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, right? And how did that work out? Well, they fell away, and it did not work out well. And by the way, let's, let's be careful, though. Let's not just say that's what people in Scripture did because it's also what we do now, right? Anytime we end up off the path, off the rails, it's because we have decided we think we know what's best, and we're going to take matters into our own hands. And so the, when we read the Bible, remember that it is reading us in return. Now we're going to look at verses 7 through 15. If somebody would like to read that, it's a little bit bigger of a chunk, but uh, it's good. Verses 7 through 15. You can say Sarai, Sarah, doesn't matter to me. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and live to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be 
All right, thank you for that. Gave you a challenging passage to read there. Don't ask me how to pronounce those. I'll make it up as I go sometimes. Um, yeah, so what do you observe or, or see in the text? There's some interesting things in here. If you had your eyes and ears open, I think you, you saw some things. And it's okay if you did. I didn't mean that to sound judgmental, but. What? The, the angel called her by her name. That's, you know, you could just, I've never noticed that before, right? You just read this passage. Hagar is just a blip on the Bible radar as we move through. But, you know, of all, God sees her. And that's what she ends up calling him, right? God has seen her plight and what she's gone through. And he calls her by her name, you know? Y'all ever, um, there's a, there was a, 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 a president at Freed, um, I think it was Milton Sewell, he could remember your name, he could have met you 150 years ago, one time, and he'd remember your name, and your children's names, and your grandparents, some people just have that ability, people love to hear their name, people love to hear their name, um, it means something to us when someone can remember our name, God remembered Hagar's name, he didn't call her a maid, he didn't call her a servant, what else do we notice about this passage? Where does he find her? Where does, where does the angel or the, the divine messenger, where does he find her? By a spring of water. You know, I would love to just do a Bible study on how many times God finds people in the wilderness. Or God finds people at a well. Or God works at a well, right? I mean, we have Jacob meeting Rachel. We have Jesus meeting a Samaritan woman. We have, uh, I'm going to forget his name as I just talked about remembering names. Uh, Elijah being remembered in the wilderness and, and fed and taken care of by God. Very interesting. By the way, does anyone hap want to happen to guess how far away Shur was from the place where Abraham and Sarah were? 80 miles. So from what I could tell, it's about 80 miles. She has been pregnant and alone and maybe barefoot, I don't know. 80 miles she has traveled. She didn't just hop in her SUV and travel there in a day. This just took maybe a couple weeks even. Okay, so imagine the state that she's in. Okay, 80 miles. Um, which only really exemplifies just how badly she wanted to get away from Abram and Sarah. Okay, Abram and Sarah don't come off looking well in this passage. All right, what else do we notice about this, this uh, little section? Anything jump out to you? He tells her to go back. Now, why do you think that is? It was God's plan. Okay. That, that's, I mean, that's right. That's a right answer. You know, don't you think God would be like, Hagar, bless your heart. That was just awful what you've been through. I've got a, I've got a family over here that's going to take you in and take care of you. Then, that's probably what we would do. Why would God tell her to go back? Yeah, and this is for this is just for fun. Let's just think about it. Yeah, what? Uh, one, I think she wants uh, her to learn to submit to, you know, the freedom of land. Yeah. Submit to the freedom land. Uh, no matter what harsh punishment there is, your job is to raise your child with your father. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so it kind of forces Abram and Sarah to deal with the consequences of their decision of we did this and, you know, it produced a child that needs to be taken care of, right? Okay. That's a great, that's a great answer. Um, and maybe there's a lesson for Hagar. Maybe Hagar needed to learn to, so the angel says to her, go back and submit to her authority, right? Uh, or, uh, yeah, submit yourself to her authority in verse 9 is what the New American Standard says. And we read earlier that Hagar had started to mock and despise Sarah. Maybe there was a lesson for Hagar here of learning to live within the family and, and play, uh, play your role or, or fulfill your role. Um, maybe there's a lesson for Sarah, kind of what you said, your second idea there, of kind of facing the person that you despise or, or avoid. Um, I heard this story one time, and I don't know if this is true or not, but there were, there were two women that were... Um, 
I think I read this in like a leadership book, but two women were bickering at work and it was just, it was just causing the entire workplace to just become toxic. And the manager brought them both in and he gave them a hundred dollar bill. He said, I want you to go to lunch, both of you, and don't come back until you figured it out. How easy is it to run from conflict, to run from the people that we disagree with or that we just don't jive with? Um, it's so easy to flee and to just avoid that person. Well, unfriend them on Facebook, right? I don't want to see them anymore. Uh, God says, hey, I want you to go back, and we're going to make this work. We're going to figure this out. Okay? What else do we notice about this passage here? Anything? Did you see the promise God gave? Uh, verse 10, I will greatly multiply your descendants. That's almost word for word what God had promised Abraham. And there's, a, there's almost a, a sense here where God's hands are tied. So sometimes God makes promises and, you know, mankind messed it up in Scripture in some way. And God's almost like, ah, okay, I guess I'll do this too. Because God made a promise to Abram that I will multiply and take care of all your descendants. And all includes who? Ishmael. So God is bound by his word to say, okay, I'm also going to take care of your descendants as well, Hagar. Okay. Um, okay. Anything else we want to observe about this passage? Oh, yeah. So God names Ishmael. Yeah. Now, don't ask me what wild donkey of a man means. I don't know. Okay. Um, maybe he was just going to be a, a tough one to raise. I don't know. Um, but then she gives God a name. You are a God who sees. Now. I don't, know what, I don't know what Hagar's faith was like. I don't know if maybe she was a believer in God. I don't know if maybe she just heard Abram and Sarah talk about God. I don't, I don't know. But it's clear that she had some level of faith because she knew who she was talking to. And she had the courage to give God a name. And she had the bravery to turn back around and walk 80 miles back to the person who had for lack of better words, abused or mistreated her, okay? And if that's not faith, I'm not sure what is. Yeah. Some people think that. Um, I think it's a great theory. I can't prove it to be 100% true, but I think it would make a lot of sense. Um, you know, Jesus has been there from the beginning, and so uh, Jesus interacting with his people and, um, you know, throughout Scripture, I think is a really neat idea. So... Yeah, that's an interesting study if you ever want to go check it out. But like I said, I can't prove it 100%. Any other questions or thoughts? Well, I want to do, I want to say a couple things. I don't want to highlight this idea that God sees. Um, God sees what you might be going through uh, today. God is with people who have broken hearts. Uh, scripture says that God keeps all of our tears in a bottle. That's a uh, from the Psalms. God is not far from us ever. Uh, God sees us when we are treated unfairly in our family or our workplace. We've all been, you ever been treated unfairly before? Ever been gossiped about? Ever been talked bad about? Uh, ever been ghosted or shunned by somebody and you didn't know why? God sees that. God sees us when we are treated unjustly. Uh, he sees us when we are grieving. Mothers, God knows your heartaches. You've lost a child. You've watched a child graduate and leave the home, and all the struggles may be in between of raising a family. He knows if maybe you haven't been able to conceive. He sees things that maybe haven't gone according to your plan. Fathers, God sees you. He sees your exasperations, the burdens you bear, the battles raging in your hearts, the desire and the struggle you have of maybe providing everything you ever wanted for your family. God sees us when we're in our own little desert, right? On the run, headed nowhere. And what does God do? Well, interestingly, sometimes God tells us to go back and face the thing. Whatever the big scary thing is that you, maybe you've run from in your life, maybe it's a, a personal conflict or a decision that you know you need to make, sometimes God says, hey, sometimes my, like my kids, I'll actually grab their heads gently and I'll like turn them around, like go back. Go say you're sorry, try that again, or I'll give them a little shove, you know. Let's go try that again. It'll be okay. I'm right here with you. That's kind of what God, God says, you know, go back, 
Go face the thing. Go talk, go talk to Sarah and let's work this out. And God says that because I am with you and I promise you that one day this is all going to work out. Even if you're not here to see it. I promise I'm going to take care of all your descendants, he told Hagar. Our God is a God who sees us in everything that we go through. Now we're going to do a quick hitter and bounce over to Genesis chapter 21. This is the main other passage where Hagar is, is mentioned. So we'll do this one a little bit quicker today, just for time. If somebody would like to read for us verses 9 through 20. And just to give you a quick setup, at this time, Isaac has been born, and Isaac is, is growing up. Some people have suggested maybe Isaac is uh, about 14 years, or excuse me, that Isaac is about three years old and Ishmael is a teenager. So maybe Ishmael's in the 14, 15 years old. Somebody want to read this for us? Verses 9 through 20. All right, thanks for reading that lengthier passage. So there's some things here. What do you notice? What do you observe? Interesting to read these two passages side by side, by the way. There's a lot of similarities, but there's some differences. What do you notice? Yeah. Yeah, this time God allows it to happen, and maybe the purpose was fulfilled. You know, all the lessons that needed to be learned were learned, or maybe the, the boy is old, Ishmael is old enough now that they can make it on their own. Yeah? What else do you notice? Can you just, can you just feel the tension dripping out of the pages, though? Yeah, there's mocking. There's, you know, once it, she, I think she calls him... Um, so look at verse 10. This is Sarah. Sarah doesn't come off well. I'm not saying Sarah's a bad lady. But she says, drive out this maid and her son. Right? It's just the contempt just dripping out of her words. That For the son of this maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. What does she see Hagar and, and Ishmael as? A threat. They're, you know, they're going to take what's mine. They're going to Mess it all up. Okay? So, what else do you notice? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so from what I, what I understand, firstborn and like ancient customs were, uh, they had a double portion of the inheritance. Um, so they would get double. And usually that was because they were, they, if the father passed, they sort of took on the fatherly role of the family. So they needed probably more land and more cattle to help take care of everybody from what I understand. Um, 
What's really interesting, though, if you read Genesis and you, and you look at it from a, a high-level view, the firstborn is almost never the one God chooses. It's very interesting. God takes that custom and turns it on his head, right? Uh, Esau was older than Jacob. Well, who became Israel? Jacob did, right? Uh, Joseph was the youngest of his brothers. Um, goes on and on and on. Very interesting how that plays out. What else do you notice about uh, this passage? Sarah and Abram and Ishmael. Look at the position Abram's in again, right? Um, Abram is distressed. Look at verse 11. The matter greatly distressed Abraham because of his son. And so, you know, there's probably part of Abraham that's like, here we go again. You know, how many times am I going to be put in this position by Sarah uh, to, to cast her out? But God, this is a little bit different here. God, in verse 12, takes care of Abraham's distress. He says, don't be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. For through Isaac, your descendants shall be named. So God almost reassures Abraham, hey, listen, the promise that we made about Isaac is still in play, right? But I'm also, verse 13, going to take care of Ishmael because he is your descendant. So God gives a promise and an assurance here uh, to Abraham. So Abraham, he, so he does it, he, he gives them some water and um, it sends them on their way, but it still feels a little heartless if I'm being honest. I mean, you just, hey, you know, best of luck to you. God made a promise to me. I hope you find your way. I don't know. It just feels a little, feels a little interesting. Uh, but, but Abraham was, was doing what, what was asked, okay? But once again, here we go. There's, there's Hagar wandering around in the wilderness of Beersheba. Uh, she becomes so distressed, she, she, she puts him down under a, under a, a, a bush, she sits on the opposite, and she's and God. God hears Ishmael crying. So Ishmael is crying out. Maybe he's close to death. Maybe he's distressed. And the angel in verse seventeen again comes to her and asks a question: "What What's the matter with you, Hagar? Don't fear, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is." And then their eyes are opened. There's a well of water, and and they're taken care of. And so. Um, and verse 20 is, is kind of the, the bow on all of this, right? God was with Ishmael, with the lad. He grew and he lived in the wilderness and became an archer. And so we know from that little anecdote that God fulfilled his promise. Okay? So I want to, I want to, we talked about how God sees, but I also want to highlight the fact that God hears. God heard the cry of Ishmael. He heard the distress of that they were in. So God hears us. Uh, Psalm 116 verses 1 through 2 says, I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call him, call on him as long as I live. And so God sees us in the trials that we have. God hears us when we cry out. And so when we read these, this passage, there's a lot happening. There's a lot of drama between uh, uh, Abram and Sarah and Ishmael and Isaac and there's just a lot of things happening but there's a lot revealed about who God is in these passages as well a lot revealed about who we are a lot revealed about who God is and what matters to him so a couple of final thoughts here uh, today God is a God who sees we've already talked about that uh, God's story Hagar's story reminds us that no matter who we are or where we are God sees us and cares about us he will comfort and provide for anyone who turns to him, and he always keeps his promises. Secondly, God is a God who hears. He hears and responds to the cries of the, 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 the disinherited, the dispossessed, the defenseless, those who are cast out. Hagar, for the most part, was guiltless, but God heard her suffering. And then God keeps his promises, number three. God keeps his promises. Uh, he made a promise to Abram, and he made a promise to Hagar, and he was bound to those promises. Uh, and as I pointed out, verses 20 through 21 uh, is kind of like an after credit scene that says, by the way, God took care of them. He took care of Hagar. He took care of Ishmael. And then the last thing this morning is that God finds lost people. God finds lost people. In the first passage, Hagar had wandered 80 miles, and she was lost, and God found her. And then here we are again, they're wandering in the wilderness of Beersheba. 
I'm not sure how far that, that is away, but I imagine it was a good distance because they were down on their luck, and God found them. And as we think about the New Testament, who did Jesus, came, uh, who did, who did Jesus say he came to seek and save? The lost, right? God finds lost people. And God has, has a way of, God has, has a way of doing that that we don't even understand or comprehend sometimes. We don't always know the way he works. We don't always know how he does it, but he does. He finds lost people. Um, and so God sees us. He sees us when we're at our worst, uh, when we're battling the, the sinful habit we can't shake. He sees us when we're, when we're behind closed doors revealing who we really are. Uh, he sees all the judgmental and you know, prideful things that we think about people or have said to people. God sees us in our heartache and our struggles. Uh, God sees us when we cry out. And, and in spite of all those awful things that God sees and knows about us, he still loves us. He sees our plight, and he doesn't leave us alone in that. He hasn't abandoned us in the wilderness with an empty canteen to perish on our own. God asks us to trust him, to lift up our eyes to him, and that is his promise to us. So any final words of wisdom before we wrap up? or questions before we wrap up our Bible study this morning. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You would almost, as a reader of this story, you would almost like to see God go to Sarah and you know, really give it to her because, you know, she doesn't come off well in this passage. And maybe off screen that happens. You know, there's some maybe behind the scenes that we don't get. Um, but, yeah, that, that is an interesting thought. He never does go back to Sarah. What else? Any other final comments? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm fortunate enough to have a son of Yeah. The name Ishmael means God hears. Uh, yes, I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah, the name Ishmael means God hears, which was our second point uh, for today. So thank you for that. Uh, Ishmael was crying out uh, underneath the tree or the bush, and God heard him. And the name Ishmael means God hears. So thank you for, thank you for that. Study Bible for the win. All right. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Now, you can say you've heard a Bible class on Hagar. So there you go. Appreciate you all being here today. Maybe we'll end a few minutes early.